Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're just going to wait a few moments to see if uh, if anybody else is joining us. I see we've already got 175 people out there, so great to have you with us. Thank you. If you just give us a few more seconds, we can see the numbers are rocketing up. So we'll just wait a moment to see who else joins us, and then we'll kick off. Yeah, numbers still going up nicely, so uh, we should be able to make a start in a few seconds. Great. Okay. Right, I think we'll kick off. That's all right with everyone. Um, so thanks very much for joining us today. It's really good to have you with us for this uh, this DPN webinar, uh, which is all covering um, how to how to manage data retention and minimization. Today we're going to be talking about. We've got a great panel with us as well. Um, so for those of you that are, are new to us and new, new to us at DPN, um, we're uh, we're a data, UK based data protection uh, consultancy. We also uh, do training for organisations large and small and also publish lots of kind of uh, content available also on our website, uh, which is dpnetwork.org.uk, if you'd like to see any more of that. Um, so my name's Simon Blanchard. I'm a partner with DPN, and uh, I'd like to now just uh, hand you over to, uh, to Robert Bond, who's our chair today. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, so I'm delighted to be chairing today. I'm uh, a senior counsel with Privacy Partnership Law. Um, we've got um, Xtero sponsoring today. Xtero empowers organisations to manage their legal governance, uh, risk and compliance requirements proactively and defensively. Uh, their legal GRC software is the only comprehensive platform that automates the complex interconnections of digital investigations, privacy, legal operations and so on, as you can see on this slide. And from Xtero today, we have Nick Rich, who is Head of Engagement for UK and Ireland. And we're also delighted to be joined on the panel today by Claire Robson, who is the Data Protection Officer for Great Ormond Street Hospital Children's Charity, GOSH. Simon, back to you. Great, thank you. I'm just going to take you through just a little bit of a scene setting introduction now. Uh, only a few slides, don't worry, it won't be death by PowerPoint. <laughs> so if you've seen, the, seen our panel here with Nick and Claire as well as Robert. Um, so a quick refresher on, on, first of all, on what the law requires. So first of all, um, it needs, it requires us to kind of limit the personal data that we collect to, you know, to what we actually need for the purposes that we're using it for, to, to limit it to what's relevant and necessary. And under kind of UK and uh, European flavours of uh, GDPR, we can only keep that data for as long as it's necessary for us to keep it for specified purposes, as they call it, for the particular purposes that we've notified people. So through our privacy information that we provide. Um, and also to consider how long we need to keep each, uh, each kind of part of that data, because if we're using it for more than one purpose, uh, we might not need to keep all of the data for, uh, you know, for so long. So we, we need to consider when to minimise that data too. Um, and to do this, we need to become familiar with the statutory requirements that we have. Uh, certain data, certain processing of data has statutory requirements in various laws, again, in different countries. And we need to be, be mindful of that. And also, if there's any sector specific kind of requirements that we have. Um, so good to look at that. Uh, where there's not a statutory requirement, which for lots of processing we do, there's, there's no law that defines how long we keep it, uh, we need to then be thinking about how long is it necessary for our organisation to be using the data, to be keeping the data, in fact, uh, for those particular purposes. And we need to do that in a defensible way um, to, to work out how long is, you know, do we really need it and be able to justify that decision if we're ever questioned by a regulator. So then to kind of start to operationalize it, once we've developed kind of uh, uh, the policy and schedule, we need to obviously yeah, develop that, that policy schedule and share it with, uh, with people across the organization, uh, clearly defining the kind of standard retention periods and equally the responsibilities that people have as well to review and, uh, and cleanse that data. So this is where we come on to things like having data owner, the concept of data ownership um, and implementing regular reviews and cleansing to make sure that we've, uh, we've identified when data is no longer needed. And uh, little thought really is just around, so what's the role of a, a DPO or a privacy team, data protection team, uh, which is to advise the business to be able to come 
kind of monitor um, how we're getting on in terms of, you know, have we have we met how how different parts of the business manage their process of, of cleansing and really to encourage good practice across the business. Uh, a little reminder really that again the law really is to keep data only as long as we need it and by making sure that we've we've cleansed the data and that we've, we've deleted data that we no longer need we're reducing the risk across the organization so if we don't have data anymore then obviously it can't be subject to a data breach um, doesn't require any additional security to be put in place and obviously if you then get a subject access request from an individual whose data you no longer have <laughs> it's no longer discoverable within the scope of that. So really, it can't come back and haunt you is the message that we're, we're getting across here, I think. Um, and obviously, it will you know, reduce the risk that you have from an enforcement point of view, but also you know, that reputational damage uh, that you could suffer from things like a breach, for example, or a privacy violation. Um, we thought it was worth just, again, just, just to explain some enforcement action and some areas whereby there has been uh, enforcement related to organisations when they have kept data for too long. Um, so just a few cases we were going to mention. The first one is Equifax here, um, again, where they've kept data for, uh, for longer than they needed. Um, they had a fine of £500,000, but that was, that was a pre-GDPR one, just to be clear. Um, so it could potentially have been you know, greater than that um, you know, post-GDPR. There was the case of doorstep dispensary, uh, which had quite a bit of special category data, you know, health related data uh, documents that were kept for too long. They had a fine of £275,000 and Viking Lines, which is a more recent case, uh, which was employee health related, uh, related information, uh, which should have been destroyed. And the regulator in that case, which was outside of the UK, but within Europe, um, £230,000 fine. Okay, so hopefully that kind of just tees it up for you, the session. I'll hand back to Robert and we'll, uh, we'll get going with the panel discussion. Well, I think we've got some polls, Simon. We have. Thanks for reminding me, Robert. Let's pop the... Uh, I'll pop That's the all pop right. We've, we've got three polls that we just wanted uh, you to um, respond to. Um, the first one is, do you know what personal data your organisation holds? And um, I'm just watching the percentages as we, uh, as I'm speaking, and I'm pleased to see that um, the vast majority say they do know what the organisation holds. Um, so I've published the results there, Robert, so that people. Yeah, let, let's close that one out. So we're looking at 60% say yes and. Uh, broadly, everybody else says partly. Um, not surprising that result. Um, I'd I'd be worried if everybody said 100%. We know what we hold because I find it's it's amazing if what we do hold. So let's have a look at the uh, second poll, if we can, please, Simon. Do you have a data retention policy and schedule? And I'm hoping that percentage wise, we will have a larger proportion saying, yes, we do have something. We do slightly. And it's looking, it's looking better. I'm slightly worried about the honesty of several percent who say we haven't got anything. <laughs> Maybe you will in another week or so. Uh, <laughs> so. We, should we close that one out as well, Simon? So it's seventy percent. Seventy percent say yes, we do. Twenty-six percent say partly, and three percent say no. Um, hopefully, we'll persuade you that you should have a good data retention schedule and policy. Okay, and finally, have you successfully implemented data retention across your organisation? This is where it's looking at probably a bit more challenging, I think. <clears throat> yes. Okay, we've about leveled out on those um, notes. Publish the results. Yeah, and, and that doesn't surprise me that the large majority is partly, because I think if any of us who are in a DPO or compliance role would say, it's really hard to get this completely nailed down. Um, so not surprising that only 11% say 
we did it successfully. And we're going to see um, during the next 45 minutes that this is a work in process. It's never really finished um, and it's never really obvious where the data is. So thank you for the polls and thank you for everybody for completing those. Let's, let's get into the Q&A if we can now, please. So, um, oh, and by the way, do send in using the Q&A um, any questions as we go along. We had an awful lot of questions in advance. Um, so I, I may only be able to deal with the ones we've selected that have been sent in, in advance, but we'll see how we go. So the first question I wanted to ask, and I'm going to give this to Claire first. Um, what are the first steps you need to take in order to be able to start getting to grips with a data retention and um, policy and periods? Claire. Thank you, Robert. And I think everyone sort of, to a degree, wants to go straight in at the end and start to try and work out their scales when actually for me, it was going back to the drawing board on what data we hold. So it was very much where Simon was talking earlier about knowing your data, because if we're taking this purely from a, a personal data perspective, you just need to understand what you've got, where it is and how it's used. Uh, and then you can start to look at what are the boundaries around that? Do Because there's numerous pieces of legislation that talk about retention, that talk about how long things need to be kept. So I think it's very much a start at the beginning, not in the middle, and, and gradually process it through. Um, and it, in some ways, it might be easier, depending on the complexity of your organisation, to chunk it up. Um, if you're a very big organisation, very complex organisation, then you might find that trying to tackle it all in one go is a little bit overwhelming. Okay. And Nick, from your perspective? Yes, I'd absolutely second uh, what, what Claire said. said. Um, knowing what you've got is, is that vital first step. And I was very interested to see the results of that first poll because um, the experience we have talking to our clients is that very often um, if, you, if you put six people from a, a client in a room, they will all think they know what they have, but there'll be six versions of that truth um, and and none of them will be complete and correct. Um, and so uh, one of the issues is um, really knowing what you've got rather than thinking you know what you've got. And, and the second piece, I suppose, is then knowing why you've got each of those pieces of information. So and that's that's a whole exercise in itself, um, which, of course, leads into things like reports of processing activity. Uh, but one of the frameworks we find quite helpful to suggest to our clients and or some of our clients have found helpful as they go on that journey is is a sort of three tier attempt to answer that question of what have you got so thinking about um, uh, in, in in the parlance I suppose da data elements the the actual pieces of, of personal information that you have um, and sorting those into categories and sorting those into what might constitute business records, as it were. And if you if you think of a, a three layer cake um, that goes upwards in generality in that way, then that's quite a good way of, of breaking down that problem, as Claire was suggesting that you you should. Uh, you know, it, it might seem tempting, for example, to start on a departmental basis. Let's solve the problem for HR. Let's solve the problem for sales. Mm -hmm let's solve the problem for whichever bit of the company does the thing the actual company the company actually does you know and so on and so forth um but but actually a, a sort of holistic approach that comes uh, bottom up from uh elements through categories to records can be quite successful we've we've seen okay and um uh, certainly my my own experience is is that um you always think you know what you've got but it's very worrying particularly with the pandemic and working from home and the increase in different devices and you know using zoom and recording on teams and so on that often the data is in so many different places 
Um, and I, 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 you know, I like the what have we got and the why have we got it questions. And um, I think if you if you do your job properly and you ask the who, what, when, where, why, and how, you begin to understand what is our data estate. Um, and 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 one of the other questions we've had in just as you have been talking is do you have any tips to identify how we undertake finding out where all the data is um from a technical point of view nick any thoughts on that well glad you asked that <laughs> so there are there are toolkits in the market um and and I'll, I'll hasten to add not just from Xtero, um, but but there are toolkits in the market that do um, a pretty good job now of crawling over your data estate and finding out what's there. Um, and I suppose there are some things to look out for um, if you're considering a software based approach, you know, which may seem like a silver bullet, right? If I've got a piece of software that lists out everything I've got, then my job's done in terms of the what have I got and I can move straight on to the why have I got it piece, right? But actually, when you're talking about petabyte scale data centers, um, it, it, it isn't feasible for any software to completely index your data estate, um, at least not without tying up your business operations for the next year or so. So it's, it's always inevitably going to be some kind of a statistical exercise to, in some respects. And so you, you, you want to look for things like a wide range of connectors into lots of different data sources and, and especially unstructured data sources like email or Slack or the other chat tools that you, you may use across the company. Um, you want to make sure that you're taking every advantage of the recent advances in machine learning to categorize that data effectively and to learn from your coding um, what counts as interesting to you and what doesn't. Um, and I think you want to think and ask some hard questions about false positives and false negatives. Uh, not every string of 13 digits in your data estate is a United States social security number. So um, can the software identify every you know, social security number as it might be um, it, it, effectively, is it misidentifying things that aren't as, as as that, and is it missing social security numbers altogether? And and what are the error bars on that? And and anyone who tells you the error bars are zero is is probably giving you snake oil. So. Okay. Okay. And I think it's also fair to say that although we live in a technologically advanced world, there is still an awful lot of information out there in organisations that's not on a machine or in a piece of software. So it's also about looking wider than just what's on the computers and talking to your staff, talking to people you work with, talking to colleagues, rummaging through cupboards and basements and lofts and all sorts of other places as well, because the data is not just in one place anymore. Uh, and I'm going to just um, talk to Simon on this one. Um, so we know we need to look for manual data and, and we need to use technology and ask questions of all the different teams but should we also be thinking about not just personal data but other types of data yeah that's a good good one robert and i think that question does come up quite a bit um with these types of projects and certainly i think there's a there's a benefit to look wider than just personal data you know to be able to look at other kind of uh, confidential or sensitive data that the organization may have um, and many organizations will, you know, will have the ambition to scale it wider and look at all of the other data because at the same time, uh, the same kind of thing will, would apply from the point of view, you, you want to know when, when should we get rid of that? How long should we be keeping it for too long? Have we got different copies of the truth on different systems, for example, so we don't no longer know where our master record is, those kind of challenges that we deal with. But the, I think one of the, uh, one of the issues around it really is just working out how big you want the project to be and what your resources can manage how much can your teams manage in one go uh, and clearly we've got um, we've got legal requirements here around uh, around personal data from GDPR perspective and, and again other laws as well around the world so from that point of view I'd suggest that we might need to prioritize the personal data and really focus on that 
but um, certainly it's a great objective to be able to look wider at certain, you know, out of the data. And of course, from a data breach point of view, uh, we've got obviously personal data breaches that you know we may need to report to uh, to the regulator, to individuals, etc. And we need to be thinking about those. But equally, what if you, you know, what if some of your confidential business information was breached? Uh, what if something else that was very sensitive but didn't include personal data? So there's certainly some great benefits to it, Robert. But I just think it comes down to the scale of ambition and the amount of resources and time that you're you're willing to put behind it really okay good good we've had a, a couple of similar questions in i'm going to turn to you on this claire mm. um, some organizations might well now know what they've got but how do you decide how long you keep it <laughs> you know what is necessary yeah. Um, and are there, there's a question, are there any resources that can tell us what, what are the regulatory retention periods for different types of data? Mm -hmm. What's your experience? And I wish I had a silver bullet, um, but like most things in this area, there isn't one, but there is a whole host of information out there in different areas. And it really does to a degree depend on what sector you work in. Uh, so for example, the NHS have an incredibly comprehensive records retention schedule that is or was the last time I looked at it about 150 pages long and lists every type of record you can think of. Um, so it's very much about understanding your sector and what you're subject to. There will be rules for financial accounting periods. There will be rules for data protection information. There will be rules for health information and other areas. So it's really about once you've got that understanding of what data you've got, where it is, why you're using it, it's then looking at what is there out there that I can use to help me. But also it's about being really pragmatic with this. So one of the things that we did when we started working through it is we looked at it from a minimum retention period perspective, not maximum retention period perspective because you do need some flexibility sometimes you need to be able to adjust what you're doing and it may not always work for you so i can't give you one website to go to that lists all the different retention periods um, but i would advise you to look and see depending on what sector you're working in whether there's any sector guidance whether you've got any professional body guidance so for accountants or chartered secretaries or however that may be uh, and it's just about combining it all together and coming up with practical, pragmatic periods that work for your organisation and taking advantage of where we have the ability to make that judgment. So for us, it's really about taking the ability to make a decision that works for us rather than having to sit with a certain time period. And that's why we, we do heavily focus on minimums. Um, so you've got your six seven years for your financial records um, but we will then look at is there another reason for the data being used are we using it for more than vat or tax or, or finance purposes and what might that mean for us what's a, what's a realistic period for us what can we manage because we also need to be able to implement it and as we saw from the poll implementation is probably even harder than writing the policy and the schedule in the first place so it has to be manageable. But, but I, I think it's about combining all, all the information you've got available to you and what you know as the specialist and the, and the expert in your, in your organisation. Yeah, and, and um, let's say I agree with you. I think it's got to be, there will be legislation that stimulates mm. certain periods, as you say. Yes. And then there will be acceptable periods like, you know, do we keep employee records for six years or seven years after termination? Mm. But then you might you might say when we get a job applicant, um, we might well keep their application data for six months, two years, even if they weren't successful, just because there might be another job that yeah. they would be interested in. But that assumes that you also build that into the privacy notice and, and that sort of thing. And um, I don't know what what are your thoughts on this, Nick? Where where do you go to try and decide what is the right period to retain? I I, I mean, it, 
cl clearly you've got to have a good handle on all the pieces of uh, legislation that are going to impact your business. And that that's extremely difficult for uh, global businesses in, 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 in particular, because then then you you do run the risk of um, uh, legislation, national legislation actually being in, incompatible with each other in some ways. Um, although I do think if you're at the point where you're wondering, you know, do I keep this particular document uh, because law X says I must and law Y says I mustn't, uh, you're probably a, a very long way um, along this process and in extremely good shape. So it's, 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 a, it's a bit sort of architecture astronautics to worry about it pr uh, prematurely, I think. Um, but but um, there is a number, there are a number of pieces of software that have a lot of the information baked into them um, so that uh, as, as uh, a retention um, as, as a document triggers a, a required piece of retention that's that's alerted to you um, that's not going to be a, a good excuse to a judge um, if you if you if you're sitting there saying well my software forgot to remind me <laughs> um, so, so I don't think it as, as Claire says it's a, it's a silver bullet or, or indeed a get out of jail free card but it's certainly a help along the way um, and like Claire says I, 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 I don't know that there are any single sources um, of all the all the information you need um, it's it's really a matter of of finding the good sources for your sector i think a lot of it is probably best practice as much as anything else most of the legislative requirements will tell you you shouldn't keep it forever but they won't necessarily give you a finite period of time so then you're starting to look at best practice guidance and recommendation, which is where you can start to work through that and what works for you. But I, I do think it's it's unusual to have a piece of law that says you must hold it for 10 years and no more. End of. Most of it will say you should hold it as long as is necessary, like data protection and GDPR do, or they might suggest a time frame that seems reasonable but it's never a maximum time frame so so having that understanding of what's statutory and what's best practice is also really important yeah and i think the certainly in those instances where things go wrong and the regulator say the ico says out of interest why did you have that data for so long having something that you can show the regulator that says well in the absence of a definitive answer this is what we felt was reasonable exactly. and i think my experience is a regulator may say we don't necessarily agree but we can see mm. you were trying to do the right thing mm. having something is better than having nothing at all we've had a couple of questions that are at the other end of the scale which is um how do you how do we fight parts of the department or the business that say unless you can tell us a reason why not we intend to keep it forever just because and i'm not pointing the finger at marketing that's often one of those and I, I, what do you say to that simon yeah that, that can be a challenge I've, I've heard that question quite a few times yeah but i think it's um it's I think there's partly an education thing, first of all, that people need to be need to recognize that data, you know, to comply with the law, that data should only be kept for as long as it's necessary. And that's usually not, you know, in most situations, that's not forever. Um, so it's just having an educated conversation with people about how long do you really need it and how long. So I'll give an example um, would be like was mentioned earlier on was um, financial data, for example, was kept typically for you know six years, things like that. But again, a lot of financial data might uh, take, say you're a retailer and you're gathering that from customer orders, for example. Um, you might want that customer order details. You, you have obviously the financial data that needs to be kept for six years, but the rest of the order related details, like the customer contact information, any behavioral information that you might have around that order, you might need to keep some of it for marketing reasons for a shorter period, probably not six years. I think it would be quite hard to justify in many businesses keeping that for, for six years. Um, and equally, you may want it for customer service reasons, for complaints, 
and you'll have history on this. You'll know how long you need to resolve a query, how long you need to resolve complaints. Typically, that might be a maximum of you know 12 months. In some businesses, it might be two years or three years. It's probably not going to be six years. So I think being able to, to ask some <laughs> maybe difficult questions in that situation about, well, how long do you really need it? You know, what evidence do you have that you might need it longer than that? Um, so uh, it's, it's always a little bit of a challenging scenario, but I think unfortunately that kind of discussion has to be had because people naturally are a bit more careful and want to keep things forever. It's We're also an education piece, isn't it? Because it's so. about bringing people on that journey with you so they understand why it's not appropriate to keep it just in case. Um, and we've certainly built into our, our training and our education and our records management, the, the records life cycle. So we look at it as in the value of the information to the organization and how that goes down over time. And for the majority of information after a certain period of time, there is no value to the organization anymore. So it's trying to help them understand rather than sitting there telling them, no, you can't keep it. It's trying to help them understand and form that view themselves. Um, and failing all else, you could just try and act like the annoying two-year-old, which is, is a DPO's right, and just keep going, why? And eventually they can't answer the question themselves. <laughs> and they get themselves to it. <laughs> Maybe not the most That's... collaborative approach, but if all else fails, just keep saying why. <laughs> That, that's a so great I'm, I'm that's just... a, a great point. But if I if I if I may say, I, I think one of the confusions the business often has with that just in case piece is look, you know, you you collected this data for a specific purpose, which you've noted down yeah. now. Um and, and and the question is not might it be useful just in case for some other purpose. The question is how long do you need to keep it for that particular purpose? And that question can really focus minds on well, you're right, I, I, I need to keep this information about the sale of my kettle for uh, the warranty period. But once the warranty is expired, I've really got no reason to keep it for the purpose that I originally captured it for. And just in case he might buy another kettle was not one of my original reasons. So that doesn't buy me an extra few years of keeping the data in that sense. Okay. Yeah, and I guess the, the what that points to is that there comes a point where the the data is of no value indeed it's toxic yeah exactly and you know there have been plenty of examples over the years where the ico has said you know you 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 had a breach and you lost this data and what worries me is you've got data that is of it's so old it literally is toxic and you know that worries me that you don't have any compliance in place at all and then you know it goes from bad to worse um so I could add, I, I other... think those examples that we gave on the slides initially what well, that was exactly mm. the situation where that data should have been deleted and it was involved in in some of those cases involved in a breach and uh, effectively you're getting a bit of a double whammy here because a you've had a data breach and then you've, you've breached data that you really shouldn't still have mm. um, and that's the problem yeah. so you've actually put more people at risk and i think that is something you could yeah. feed back to the business owners um to to explain you know watch out what what are the issues when holding data too long so i'm going to actually carry on with you simon because one of the other questions we've got is is sort of the other side of this, which is, OK, we've now decided we don't need the data. What does erasure look like? And can we truly de-identify data? How do we deal with data erasure or deletion? Yeah, I think that's a good point. So the default option for, for most organisations will be to, once you've identified the data that you don't need, to delete it. To destroy it would be, I guess, the right word to, to do that and making sure that you're not keeping other copies of it. If you've got it on two systems, three systems, because in the modern world, things are interconnected. They flow from system A to system B to system C. You might have uh, other copies of it um, on other systems. So making sure that you've deleted. But you're right, Robert, there is the option of de-identifying data, uh, which might happen or to um, you can anonymize it, of course, if you can completely anonymize. But uh, the key thing here is you need to take out all of the personal identity identifiers to do that everything that could be used to match back to the individual because it wouldn't meet the requirements otherwise unless you completely anonymize it um, and I think that can be quite tricky for organizations to do 
um, you know, to be able to actually remove all of the personal identifiers isn't, you can't always spot them uh, in, immediately. And it's, um, it can be, to be honest, more trouble than it's worth sometimes. Uh, I think there needs to be a real benefit in doing it, a real business benefit. Um, and I appreciate that some systems can find it quite challenging, especially older legacy sort of systems. They struggle sometimes with uh, retention requirements. Um, again, which which sometimes they you have to actually put, you know, almost blank the data out rather than, uh, you know, find find ways around the solution. So uh, again, that might be a good one for for Nick as well, where you've come across these sort of challenges as well. So I put you on the spot there, Nick, but I think it's something <laughs> no, no, not at, not at all. And I, I mean, it, it's it's absolutely correct that the proliferation of data is is a real problem, and I think there's two pieces there. Um, one is that on, on the getting rid of toxic data, um, we, we do a lot of work in litigation support and e-discovery as well as the, the data protection side. Um, and, and of course, I, I'm going to phrase this very carefully. Um, as, as soon as uh, litigation is in prospect, you absolutely have a duty to preserve uh, data that may become uh, evidential um, in that litigation. and, and uh, Robert will correct me if I've, if I've misphrased that at all, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, I hasten to add. Uh, but but, but at, when there isn't litigation in prospect, uh, that old data filling up your hard disks and your backups and so on is potential evidence uh, in, in litigation against you that you don't yet have any requirement to preserve. And, and so if you're preserving it by default, um, in a sort of pack rat mentality, you're simply increasing the risk. And, uh, you know, so GDPR fines are one thing and, and bad enough, but uh, litigation settlements can be uh, just as bad as well. So so not not having the data that you don't have to have is a great idea for uh, companies of, of, of all sorts. And now on the on, on the physical side, where does data proliferate? Well, all over the place. So, um, you know, backup systems, of course, um, old mainframe applications, and then the tape backups from the mainframe applications. I was working with a client a couple of years ago who had a whole load of data they put on microfiche, and they had something like 14 cabinets full of microfiche, and then they'd, they'd moved head office and, and didn't have room for 14 cabinets, so a, a random seven cabinets of microfiche had come along for the move. Well, so at that point, nobody knows what data is in there and, 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 and what isn't, right? So so if you're trying to say, well, I'm sure I've got rid of all the copies of data X, Y, and Z, uh, you, you know, those, those sorts of systems can be really challenging to do. But the more you can do it, the, the more de-risk you are, really. So. Well, and just, just to add to Nick's point, so from the lawyer's point of view, yes, if there is litigation hold, in other words, that either because of litigation or in anticipation, you're required to keep data, that, that does need something in your policy that, that defines how you make sure that the, that, that hold takes place and that you know it is aware that automatic overrides need need to stop etc the other side of the coin as well i think is is that when you get weaponized subject access requests wouldn't it be lovely if you didn't have 20 years of stuff to have to go through and again i think you know with hindsight it would be it would be very valuable if your retention policy guided you that there is no reason to be keeping data that long. So let's just not have it. Um, we've had a question in about um, what does anonymization really mean? Does it really mean that the data is anonymous or can the individual be re-identified? Simon. Yeah, so anonymized means that there are no personal identifiers that you could use to match back to the individual at all. Um, whereas there is another term that we should just explain, pseudonymized. 
uh, which is a term that means there's still a personal identifier in there, which might be, I'll give you an example, it could be a customer reference number, for example. So by reducing the number of identifiers right down, de-identifying as much of it as possible, so I might take out the name, the email address, the telephone number, those kind of things, and just reduce it right down, we're reducing the level of risk if we had a data breach. That's the thing, we're reducing it right down to a number. But if that got out into the into the wide world, it would be very hard for an organization or for somebody else, um, maybe a bad actor, to be able to, to use that data in anger if it only had a reference number. Having said that, it doesn't completely de-risk it um, because the danger is, of course, somehow you may be able to match it back. Um, if you had a reference number, somebody's going to know, be able to match back. Certainly on your systems, you can match it back from a reference number back to um, the name, the address, etc. So um, we need to consider that sometimes when we're removing some of the identifiers, we'll just actually end up with a reduced risk form of data called pseudonymized. Um, Whereas anonymizing to means taking out all of those personal identifiers, you will never be able to get the personal data back. That's how I take it. Yep, thank you. Um, I've got another question, which um, I'll, I'll turn to um, Claire first. The question was, how granular should we be when bucketing together, say, HR or customer files, which might compromise documents with different rotation requirements. How do we deal with that? And I think with that, my advice would be having developed a data retention schedule from scratch and implemented it in part. Um, the trick is to be pragmatic. The more granular and the more complex you make your retention periods, the harder it is to actually implement it in practice. Now, within reason, if you have one file for a HR file, example, for example, that's made up of lots of different parts, where it's practical to do so, and each part has a different recommended retention period, you would naturally keep things for different periods of time. However, the practical implementation of that, keeping on top of it, making sure that the right bits are deleted at the right time is really, really hard. So in some cases, it may be that the organization wants to take a decision to group together things that are relevant and appropriate and sort of work together and come up with a retention period for the whole file rather than bits of it. So it's really about what's actually doable, what can you actually comply with, because we could all have a beautiful retention schedule that had a different retention period against almost every single possible piece of information you could think of, but could we actually implement that? Probably not, or it would be really difficult and it, you'd, you'd almost create a whole army of people needed to be doing it. So, so pragmatism, I think, is a key thing. And I, I personally, from a practical perspective, think it's perfectly fine within reason to be bucketing things together and coming up with a retention period for the whole thing rather than bits of it. But I would say that you should always do that in a carefully considered way with an eye to what's, what the organization does and any guidance that you've got from your overarching regulatory bodies or any legal guidance and document your decisions because that way you have and understanding going forward of why the decision was made. And you can, like you say, the, the ICO can come in and say, we don't agree with you, but you can say, well, this is why we ended up here rather than here. And we can reconsider uh, that we have the understanding of what we've got there. The worst thing would be to have a retention period that you can't implement and you can't justify and you can't show why you got there in the first place. So. I'm just intrigued from your experience. Mm. Have you have you found that you sort of started on but like I'm trying to think the right way, modularized what you're doing? Yeah. Do you keep coming back and adding and improving to your policy? Yes, I, I would say very much that when we when we approved our policy and retention schedule, we did it on the basis that the policy was the policy, but the retention schedule was an agile document that we would change and update and amend. And to be quite honest, you never think of everything the first time round. There's even now, 
three, four years after we revamped our retention schedule, we're still coming up with different records and different information that is sort of covered by what's there, but maybe not explicitly. So we're always adding to and looking at it. Uh, it it's never, I don't think it's ever a document that you finish. It's something that just evolves as your organization evolves. Mm, I agree, okay. Claire, if I can just chip in, I think that's much like for organizations that have to create a record of processing activity. Mm. You know, we're doing, we're gathering new data at different times. Uh, organizations are often, you know, we're innovating, uh, having new uses for data. So just like we need to keep the record of processing up to date, we need to, uh, we need to update our retention schedule and keep reviewing it and uh, moving it forward. Yeah. And as you bring okay. online different systems as well. <laughs> your system limitations will also have a, have, a, have a say in how long you keep the records for as well. So that, you know, that when you're looking at it, you need to look at it in the round and in the whole and not just as one thing with, with tunnel vision. Have you found, Nick, that from a technology perspective, there are instances where you can help by getting the client to minimize the amount of data that they hold to make retention easier to manage? Absolutely. And, and that's the, the hybrid approach that, that you need, I think, um, to um, achieve uh, Claire's level of, of, of pragmatism, which I think is exactly the right approach. And, and again, that structured uh, view that, that um, I spoke about earlier, I suppose, where, where you think of um, elements and then and then categories and and then how they build up into business records kind of points the way uh, towards that because you can say yes I've got this large thing called a customer record but it it contains a number of perhaps physical unstructured uh, uh, files on my my data estate there may be some emails in there there may be some records in Salesforce there may be some contracts and so on and so forth so there's a whole bundle of things but in the end the the things you care about in there are the the data elements that you're keeping about that 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 particular customer in the record and and so being able to say well i really want to get rid of this kind of element and therefore that means that i need to get rid of these particular files but I can still hang on perhaps to the rest of my customer record because I have a reasonable use case for it. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. But <clears throat> once you've got a structured approach like that, then then you can <clears throat> define and document what you're doing relatively clearly. So. Yep. And, and um, sort of from that, um, how do you deal, Simon, with unstructured data? How do you harness that? I, th I think for many, many organizations, that can be the most tricky area, particularly for well, for email and for Teams and Slack and all of those kind of things. Yeah, it's um, it's about, I think, taking advantage of what tools are available to help you search through and identify what's on there. Um, I think the other key part is recognizing that sometimes that data comes that comes in through email, for example, um, it's rightful places somewhere else. <laughs> There's usually a system for it to be stored on and the email might not be the, the place that you should be keeping it. Uh, and again, having some kind of regular review, I think, is, is good for this to encouraging your teams. Because again, at the end of the day, we're all email users and we're all receiving emails. So to it, it does come down to the education piece and having having maybe a time. Uh, I know one of my clients, for example, did they had a January kind of uh, cleanup uh, where they went to everyone and said, right, have a look at your emails, clean it all up, and then they're planning to do that every year, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's finding a practical approach that works for your organization that people will will do. Um, but it's it's there is, I think, as, as Claire said on some other things, and Nick has said, to, there is no silver bullet to that one. Uh, unstructured data is probably the most challenging. So if there's, there's tools quite often with these, uh, with, with the systems that will enable you to identify what, what data you have, whereabouts it is. Um, the challenge really is just to work out whether there's any reason to keep it or not anymore. And quite often there isn't. So I've got one more question before we sort of start to wrap up. And I'll start with you, Claire. How have you, or what are your tips for getting each part of the business to engage with this process? 
very good question. And some parts of the business will engage easier than others. Um, we've very much done it in the way of talking to people to understand what they do, what data they collect and why they collect it. We've tried to make it about how can we help you be more efficient? How can we make sure your data works for you? Um, there's an element of, um, from a technical side uh, and working in a charity, our funds are not indefinite. Therefore, there comes a point at which we have no storage left on our systems and we have to delete because we can't keep buying more storage and creating more and more records. So it's about looking at it from a business model perspective, but it's really about those conversations and it's about helping them to understand that it's not my job as DPO to deal with the records retention, it's our job and that good records management supports the organisation to be more efficient, more effective and from our perspective in the long run to raise more funds to help the children at the hospital. So it's bringing it back to that underlying purpose and making them feel that it's important and that it's part of their role and it will help them in, in being more efficient and more effective. And Nick, any thoughts from yourself? Um, yes, I mean, I, I think the, the, the involvement of business owners is, uh, you, you know, clearly critical. And so, again, to the extent that you're looking for software solutions, look for solutions that come with um, built-in workflow that's easy or integrate with existing workflow tools that are really easy to use. So a business owner perhaps is invited to join in contributing to a report of processing activity or creating a data retention schedule, um, clicks a link, goes to a website um, that, that contains a questionnaire that's made relevant to them, doesn't have a list of every single application your, your organization uses, but perhaps just the applications that um, uh, you know you you know that person's department that that department uses so things are customized and tailored and I think people really react well to the sense that they're looking at something where someone's put a little bit of thought in to make it easier for them to engage and then they can engage and fill in those questionnaires um, and and answer questions and help set schedules and and so on and so forth um, in, in a much easier way. And again, of course, what workflow does is um, allows for nagging them if they don't do it. So, uh, uh, you know, which, which connect because the, it's the second or third email that actually often gets the answer and, and who's got the time to manage that kind of process manually, right? So, so I think, so, so the, the, the tip is um, leverage um, workflow features in the software to really try and automate as much of the process of engagement as possible to take away busy work and, and allow people to feel that they're really being listened to. Thank you. Um, I've got one more question that's just come in. Um, so we were talking about anonymization and um, Stephen says, how do you deal with personal data that say stored on CCTV or videos? Um, is blurring the face sufficient to de-identify mm -hmm. and i was gonna i was going to answer this myself because we recently well last year one of my clients who makes floor cleaners um industrial size ones that you see in shopping centers started to look at doing a um small one, a small robotic one that you might use in your home or a warehouse or whatever. It had loads and loads of cameras on it. Uh, the, the robotic manufacturer assured us that their, every time an individual's face was caught by the camera, it was automate, automatically pixelated so you could not identify the individual. So there wasn't any personal data, albeit there must have been for a fraction of a time. But, given that this thing whizzes around at ankle height on the floor we were saying but what if everybody knows that jane is the one with that tattoo mm -hmm. you've got personal data you can identify mm -hmm. it's, it's it is very very difficult as we were saying to truly truly yeah. 
uh, de-identify uh, an individual. Um, we just sort of... Robert, Sorry. if I may say that the technologies in this area have come on incredibly. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen a demo, for example, of one that you can you can choose whether it de-identifies the face, whether it de-identifies the whole body, that tracks them as they move across the screen to to blur it. It will it will blur it in various different ways. It can identify an individual's car in case that was recognised. It can it can de-identify all sorts of things, including moving objects. So I think the technologies actually come on leaps and bounds in that area. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. Although, if your if your if your floor cleaner was good enough, you should be able to recognise people by their reflections, surely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very, oh, very good, yeah, very good. Um, just just very very quickly, there was a, a there's been another question about um, if we're holding, for example, sensitive data and we're closing down our charity, for example. Mm -hmm. Should we be keeping that in case somebody comes back with a complaint? And that is one of those classic instances where there may be very good reasons why you retain data for longer than might normally be necessary, because if you don't have the data, you can't defend yourself. Um, with, with like three minutes to go, I'm going to quickly ask uh, Claire, any, any final takeaways, tips, pitfalls you want to share with us? I think for me it's about bringing people on the journey with you. It's about making them understand the importance of what you're trying to achieve and it's about keeping your expectations real. So that pragmatism, that practical application to your organisation. So this is our job, not my job. It's about making it as embedded as possible so it doesn't become an extra thing. Uh, but it's also about keeping those records and again i know we're talking about records retention but having that documentation that shows how you got to the decisions you've got to especially where your retention periods are maybe a little bit different from what you might normally expect so if you if you have a three-year period in some cases and you choose five that could be absolutely fine but not if you can't explain why you've chosen five so okay. so for me i think looking at it from a real practical implementation perspective that that's the key thing to doing it and to recognize it is hard there's never a right answer we need to take advantage of the gray while we have it because actually if we had a very strict rule that told us exactly how long we had to keep everything for that might end up being more detrimental to us than being given the freedom to make those choices ourselves thank you claire and nick same to you any tips takeaways uh, uh, yeah i mean again i, I i'd second every everything claire said there and one of the ways to bring business departments along with you is you know this isn't just insurance against risk of, of fines and reputational damage there's also a money coming up through the floorboards effect mm. of having good data hygiene uh, you know lower data storage costs can be really significant uh, i i had one client who if, if asked, would have thought they had about 10,000 contracts on the premises and having done a, a data hygiene approach like this and looked at what personal information they had, discovered that they actually had about 83,000 contracts in places they never thought anyone stored contracts, including top drawers of desks and C drives yeah. and so on and so forth, right? Now, the ability then to look at those contracts and ride uh, uh, clauses in them and so on, again, is a money up through the floorboards exercise that can easily outweigh the cost and effort of, of joining in um, the, the sorts of processes we've been talking about today. Fabulous, thank you. And I'll hand over to you, Simon, to uh, close us out. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so um, I'd just like to say thanks, everybody. Thank, uh, thank you to the panel. Um, thanks to Extero for our sponsor, and thank you, Robert, for hosting. Um, and thank you all very much for, for joining us today. I hope you've all found it uh, very useful. Um, there will be a copy of the recording uh, made available in about 24 hours time or 24 hours from our start time, 4 p.m. GMT. Uh, so you should, uh, for those that are on here, we'll, you should get an email that, uh, that gives you a link to the recording. Again, if you want to go through it again or share it with colleagues. 
Um, so yeah, just a huge thank you. And finally, just to mention, by the way, if there's any more guidance that you would like, and I know there's been questions around uh, where can we get kind of template schedules, information like that. Um, DPN did publish some guidance in this area. Uh, so on our website, you will find the, uh, the DPN data retention guidance and the schedules that are attached to that, which would help you with, uh, uh, with areas around, again, a bit more information on how to go about setting your retention periods and engaging the business and those kind of things. So uh, thank you all. Thanks for joining us. Uh, hope to see you again soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.